to the quarterfinals of Grand Prix Oklahoma City. I'm Ben Sek. I'm next to Jacob Van Lunen. We're actually going to be watching Patrick Tierney versus Larry Lee. Patrick Tierney playing a uh, Jeskai Breach deck. So this is kind of a Jeskai control deck with through the breach. Yeah, it's a really cool deck. It's something that we haven't really seen. It's kind of a like they took the blue red through the breach deck and they shoved it together with a Jeskai control deck to make this uh, weird amalgamation. And uh, it's working out very well for him. He was the last undefeated player in this tournament this weekend. And Larry Lee in the eighth seed <coughs> is playing Scape Shift. Yeah, so th what his deck is trying to do is he's trying to get a lot of lands in play. We saw this deck last round. And, uh, you know, eventually he will combine Valakut the Molten Pinnacle with a lot of mountains to uh, finish off the opponent in multiples of three damage. Once you have seven lands in play, you can play Scape Shift and sacrifice all of your lands. And that'll allow you to search up six mountains and one Valakut, which lets you deal 18 damage to the opponent. If your opponent is at above 18 life, you simply need more lands in play so that you can start increasing that 18 damage exponentially. Right. Okay, so the plays are like already on turn three. It's a little bit of interaction, um, a mana leak on a Sakura Tribe Elder, um, and a little bit of hand sculpting with Opt. But apart from that, not too much action so far. Um, who do you think is kind of like favorite here? Uh, so traditionally, uh, Primeval Titan decks do pretty well against control decks simply by virtue of having access to more mana than the opponent. However, Patrick Tyranny's control deck is winning with Through the Breach. And Through the Breach seems like a pretty good way to punish a Titan Shift deck because they're going to have to sacrifice all their permanents. The game basically ends when you do that to them. And they have no way to defend against it. Like They don't have counter magic. They don't have discard. All he has to do is put a Through the Breach next to Emrakul the Eon's Torn in his hand and have five lands in his hand, and the game ends, essentially. So I'm going to say that Jeskai Breach is pretty heavily favored in this matchup right here. Okay, so uh, in the previous turn, Patrick played a Snapcaster Mage on an Opt, um, getting some pressure on the board. But it uh, doesn't seem to have red so far, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, he, he can have access to it because, like, there we go. There's a Steam Vents. Now Larry Lee is cycling a Sweltering Suns. Yeah, Sweltering Suns a nice addition to these uh, Scape Shift style of decks. You know, previously when they played these Sweeper cards, it was a pretty big problem because they were forced to play some number of them in the main deck, but then you'd play against decks where they were just absolutely dead cards, and it would feel really bad for it to be your draw step. But here, he has Sweltering Suns, which has Cycling, so that allows him to just replace it in his hand with another card. Okay, so plays another land, an extra land with the Explore. So he's he's very close to actually getting to Primeval Titan. Next turn has the mana for that. Yeah, and I mean, that's very good, but Patrick has a decent amount of counter magic in his deck, and he can use that counter magic to uh, slow the game down to the point of where he's able to put together his combo. Okay, Patrick attacking with the Snapcaster Mage, getting Larry down to 16. We've just acquired deck list. So, so what is, you know, uh, Patrick giving up for actually putting the through the reach, like combo into his deck? So he, it, it depends on how you look at it. Um, his deck, by giving that up, is not playing the creatures that you might play that would apply pressure on his opponents. Otherwise, things like Vendillion Click, things like Geist of Saint Draft, things like uh, Spell Queller. And in a sense, like he doesn't get kind of that counter punchy, uh, you know, aggro control feel to the deck that other Jeskai decks often do, or and, he, and he's definitely not as pure control as the more controlling versions of the deck are. However, what he gains is an unbelievable level of power against decks like the one he's playing against right now. These decks that don't have discard, these decks that don't have counter magic, these decks will just lose when he puts the th when he puts the Eldrazi next to the through the breach in his hand. The game ends, and that's an incredible thing to have access to. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, Larry Lee's escape shift deck. Is there anything uh, interesting going on here? Um, his main deck looks pretty stock. Uh, he is uh, playing two Colony Heart Expedition, which is a card which has a uh, you know, waxed and waned in terms of popularity over the years. Uh, 
post board, he has some uh, interesting cards here. I think Witchbane Orb is a card that uh, you know we've seen from time to time in these types of sideboards that seems like it can be good in a lot of matchups yeah. for a deck like this. It's generally g really good in the mirror because it, yes. it turns off being able to actually go uh, with scape shift like if, if your opponent has it. Yeah, however, not very good in this matchup. I think in this matchup he's uh, probably going to be sideboarding in uh, a Beast Within, uh, perhaps a Reclamation Sage if he happens yeah. to see the search for Azkantas so just because he's looking for things to replace Sweltering Suns with. So Larry Lee summon using Summoner's Pact to retrieve a Primeval Titan, which he's going to be able to, to cast. So w one of the benefits of like the Titan Shift deck in general is that it can play a pretty reasonable fair game. Yes, it, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the thing is you're just ramping into your Titan and or your Scape Shift, and when you do that, it becomes very, very difficult to lose. Uh, is Patrick allowing this to resolve? Um, I don't know. It looked like Patrick actually had a reasonable amount of land in hand, so I mean, he doesn't have that many counters. So I think he might just be saying it's okay. He had he does have a path of uh, path to exile, so <clears throat> he'll be able to get the land, mm -hmm. but won't um, be able to like you know take advantage of it next turn. All right, so you know Larry. Not in that bad of a spot here. Uh, he's going to get to search for this land for Path to Exile. Then he's going to get to search up two more lands after that. And uh, now, one of the things that uh, Larry needs to remember is that he cast Summoner's Pack this turn. That basically becomes one of the more important things. And because he has these two Valor Cuts and he has these five mountains in play, every single mountain that Larry plays for the rest of the game is going to deal six damage. Patrick, which is really powerful. And remember, his deck is like all ramp spells and lands. So now he can just start playing lands, playing those ramp spells, and those are going to kill Patrick. Okay. So Patrick attacking for four to Larry and if putting him down to ten. Paying for the pact. Always a wise move. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. And explore for Larry. Patrick just letting that one go. I think... Do you think if he plays a mountain, he's just going to get rid of the Snapcasters just to give himself some breathing room? I imagine he would, uh, because if he doesn't, then the, uh, you know, the double burn spell could finish off the game, and he knows that his opponent is playing uh, you know, Lightning Bolts and Lightning Helixes. Yep. I, I think... Uh, our left hand is a little bit off right now, but the, the, um, I, I believe that Larry's Yeah, because Larry's in 10, right? Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> so I think Larry is like, trying to decide whether he should play a mountain. No, sorry, like kill the Snapcasters? He is trying to decide what he's going to do with these Falcut triggers. So, Oh, he's actually going upstairs... Putting Patrick to, well, six, yep. and now 12, now on, he's down to seven. He yep. was able to play two land because he, of the Explore. Yeah, and it's now uh, he has Lightning Bolt and another Mountain in hand. So unless Larry is able to finish this game off on this turn, the same's over. Yeah, I mean, like, I think his best shot is actually to through the Breach an Emrakul because that would actually put him pretty far down on land and probably not enough to actually yeah well he just wins right because yeah. he uh, deals enough damage that's true too but uh, something that's interesting that's happening here is that Patrick Tyranny has a lightning helix on hand and lightning helix changes the math mm -hmm. so Larry Lee he has that land he has that lightning bolt that's 9 damage Patrick Tyranny's at 7 the thing is Patrick Tyranny can jump up from 7 up to 10 leaving himself at one life, which puts him out of range of what Larry Lee is going to do on this next turn. Oh, oh he's using the Lightning Bolt on what the Snapcaster Mage. Why do you think he decided that? I mean, he, he, was, he was going so much about, like, to upstairs, and he seems to have just changed his mind here. Yeah, it's interesting. He, uh, he seems to have changed gears here, but uh, maybe he had a good read. Maybe he thought, oh, he, he drew a Lightning Helix. I feel it. I feel it in my bones. Okay. Now I like it. 
actually, no, he yep. loses, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh, well, so this Lightning Helix puts him up to 10. However, uh, Larry Lee has, you know, four Valakut triggers ready to go. He can yeah. sacrifice his Skur Tribe Elder, deal six, he has play his land, deal six, and that'll be the game. Okay, so Patrick goes to four, and now he sacrifices the Sakura Tribe Elder, doing six, putting him to minus two. And so Larry Lee actually takes the first game with the two Valakuts in his deck, just kind of like doing the whole the whole amount of damage. I mean, wow! It, it was it was just just got out a lot of land. I mean, that that uh, Primeval Titan was really pivotal, even though it didn't get to attack. Yeah, and uh, I was very surprised to see it resolve even. You know, it's one of those things. And, it, I mean, you take a look at Patrick Tierney's deck list, and, uh, you know, there's not really that much counter magic. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's shaved a little bit here. So he has three cry cry cryptics instead of four, so that's a little bit less. He only has mm -hmm. two mana leaks. Um, he has two remains. But that's it. No yeah. more counter spells. Okay, now we're just going to move over to the second quarterfinal. Adam Pannoni versus Raymond De uh, Detivo. Um, it's Titan Shift versus Living End. It looks like we're in the, let's see, I'm trying to figure out if we've actually, yeah, so, so I believe this uh, Monstrous Carabid actually would just hard cast because I, I, I see a removed um, Simeon Spirit Guide and only four lands, so I don't think there's any other way for that Carabid to actually be in play other than just being, you know, turboed a little bit with that Simeon Spirit Guide. But on the other side, Adam has his one of his best threats. Primeval Titan. Looked, yeah. Looks it, like Raymond's in a bit of trouble. Yeah, it looks like Raymond could just lose on the next turn. Primeval what? Titan could attack, find a pair of uh, Valakuts. Then uh, Adam could uh, you know, just kill him. Sacrifice his Wooded Foothills, play land from his hand. That's it. Yeah, so, I mean, it's possible that Raymond could cycle a few times and go for a living end here, right? Absolutely. And uh, that's what this living end deck does. Is it's playing a whole bunch of cycling creatures. The deck got a lot better recently as more cyclers came out. Um, you know, there are so many new cards that only cost one to cycle or you know, just basically fill your graveyard much more quickly. And in cycling for one, they're able to find your Cascade spells that let you cast your Living End for free. And they're also, you know, making your combo more powerful when it happens. The incredible thing about Living End is that it not only puts this huge army into play for you, but it also kills everything on the battlefield. Okay, so it actually seems that the, the way the Caribou got into play was actually the Living End, because there's one in the graveyard. Um, Raymond decides to try and knock... Adam's mana down a little bit with a beast within. What do you think he's trying to keep him off? So I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to prevent Adam from getting to that critical point. Because a lot of the time what people want to do is they want to have, you know, some number of Valakuts and exactly four mountains in play before they attack with the Remuel tie in, and then they search for two mountains at the same time. And even though they only had four mountains and the Valakuts in play before they searched they get to deal the damage for all of the mountains because they're all coming to play at the same time and they check each other at the same time. So, so that's what he's trying to keep them off of. So Ramus um, casting a Demonic Dread on his Monstrous Carabid really doesn't really care about the, the, the Dread ability too much. He's actually more interested in the Cascade. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, Jack, he's going to be able to like destroy the two creatures in on the on the side of like Adam and his own monstrous carabid, but ultimately that's you know gives them a lot of time, gets rid of the one of the biggest threats on uh, on Adam's side. And I think he gets to return a Fulminator Mage, which also may allow him to knock Adam off a few more turns. Adam gets a Sakura type elder of his own. And Fulminator Match, very good in this matchup. It's a, a card that Living End wants to play in the main deck. It's a, it's a creature that you can just sacrifice for some sort of advantage. Um, there we have a look at Demonic Dread. 
uh, for those that haven't really seen the Living End deck before, it plays no spells with converted casting cost below three. That way, when you cast a card like Demonic Dread, when you start cascading, the only thing you're able to hit is Living End. And as a result, you get to, you know, destroy all the creatures on the battlefield and return all of your creatures from the graveyard back to play. So Adam decides to uh, sacrifice his Sakura Tribe Elder at end of turn. Possibly so he can actually, if he happens to draw a six mana spell, he's actually able to cast it. Because it's, it, if he draws a Titan, he may want to actually use that this turn, especially if he doesn't actually have an untapped land available to him. And if he's able to play a land, any land, and uh, escape shift on the following turn, that would be lethal. Yep, he does have a escape shift in hand as far as I can tell. Um, so. I've got a quick glimpse of his hand, so he may just be trying to you know, set himself up for this turn. And Here to land? I think he's got a, a, a Valakut and a Scape Shift, so, but I'm not positive. Should be good. Okay. Ooh. Okay. I, that might not be the case, because I don't know if you'd actually want to sacrifice the Wooded Foothills beforehand if you had a Scape Shift. I agree. If he had landscape shift, I'd be surprised if he had sacrificed those wood foothills right now. Um, I also don't know how many mountains are remaining in his graveyard or in his deck at this point, which makes things a bit confusing. I don't know how many loops we've had of this Fulminar Mage. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think it's gone twice, so... Um, it's Plus the Beast Within. He's, yeah. he's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. They usually can, like, can lose anywhere up of like five or six lands before it starts getting really troublesome. Mm -hmm. And they always have the option of like, getting multiple Valakuts into play. So he doesn't have the Scape Shift right. plus the Valakut. But he does have Premier Titan. Which is obviously what... Okay. Let's see. Let's... We're almost ready to go back to the, the main match, but we're just going to have a look at... Yeah, so uh, right here we're seeing Adam uh, have this Primeval Titan. He's going to search up his library for two fetch lands. The reason he's finding these fetch lands is because he wants to you know, maintain the number of mountains that are in his deck so that he'll be able to combo Raymond when he needs to. Uh, if he did have a Scape Shift in hand, I, I can't quite tell, but if he does, then he just needed that seventh land to win on that turn, but he did not find it. Now Raymond... Uh, once again being given the turn again has no creatures in the battlefield his uh, graveyard seems to be a, a monstrous carabid and a fulminator mage and he's going to need to cascade into another living end so that he can get this primeval titan off of the table and start pressuring Adam again if he wants a chance of winning this game. We have some results from, from the back tables. Uh, Michael Byers um, has taken the first uh, game versus Nathan Smith and Seth Manfield has taking the first one over Julian John. So we've got two games that have been completed on the back tables. Um, we're going to actually go back to our main, main round because uh, we want to make sure that we see the entire match there. Yeah, this seems like a, a really interesting matchup too. I'd, I'd like to watch this. The, uh, the Titan Shift deck is, you know, again, it's a deck that has traditionally done well against control decks by virtue of simply having more mana than the control decks. And also, you know, it's hard to play truly hard counter magic in a format like Modern. And uh, one of the interesting things about a card like Scape Shift is that you're casting it, it costs four, but you're casting it when you have seven or more lands in play. So it's just naturally resistant to mana leak. Right. Like it's a, uh, you know, foolproof, if you will. Foolproof. <laughs> so you're saying I can play that? <laughs> uh, exactly, of course you can. I can too. <laughs> All of us fools. Okay, so... Larry seems to actually had a pretty good start to the to the game. Two search of tomorrows, one of the more efficient ways to get ahead on on the mana front. Patrick playing a serum visions. He has it through the bridge, and he may even have an ember call. So, but I'm not sure if he has enough mana yet. And may not have. Uh the fourth and fifth land in hand. Larry, uh, his mana's exploding over here. Going up to three when he searches the first time. He can play a land now, go to four. On the following turn, he can already be uh, threatening to cast Primeval Titan. 
Scary stuff. If you're in Patrick's seat. How, how did the uh, matchup change in after sideboarding? So I think post-board, uh, Larry Lee's escape shift death gets a bit worse. I mean, he's probably bringing in Chandra, Torture Defiance. He's probably bringing in three copies of Relic of Progenitus. But, I mean, when we look at Ro Patrick Tierney's deck post-board, he gets to bring in a decent amount of extra counter magic, which is really good in a matchup like this. For example, Disdainful Stroke seems like, you know, the coolest card in the history of the planet <laughs> when you're playing against the deck that just wants to resolve scape shifts and primeval titans. Um, then, uh, you know, even Negate is quite strong. He has a few copies of that post board. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it just seems like the, the matchup improves for Patrick post board. And I think it already favored him pre board to some degree. So, yeah, no, it was actually much closer um, than we were sure about. Sorry, much closer than it, it looked. On paper. On paper, yeah. Absolutely. And that's something that I think these happens with these Scape Shift decks. Over the years, when you look at them on paper, they've always kind of looked a little bit worse than they end up doing in any particular format. So L Larry's actually going to sacrifice his Relic of Progenitus, mainly just to get a cycle, though it probably hurts uh, Patrick in uh, any future Snapcast Mages. So now Larry uh, searching up the sixth land. If he has another land, then he's capable of dealing 18 this turn. Perhaps more if he can combine it with a bolt. But uh, I imagine Patrick has some way to interact here. He has a negate, but I don't know if he has any other types of counter spells in hand. So I wonder if if Larry goes for something like a Summoner's Pact, do you think that he'll let it resolve? Or like, you know, or do you think that he'll actually counter it if he is in the gate. I mean, okay. Because one of the dangers is if he doesn't have another counter spell, the Titan's going to be really, really painful for him. Absolutely. But the thing is, if he counters it, it didn't. It only costs Larry zero mana. So he would, would be able to like resolve something else. Yeah, by not countering it, you're also tying up four of Larry's men on the following turn. Okay. Seems fairly likely that Larry's going to try and play this Primeval Titan while he has six mana up. Yeah, also, they've seen each other's deck lists, so Larry knows that with three mana available, there aren't a ton of different cards in Patrick's deck that can actually counter this Primeval Titan. Yeah. One of the interesting things is if Patrick actually has a remand in this spot, um, the Titan will go back to his hand he won't actually be able to cast it the next turn because he'll be locked under his um, Summoner's Pack for an additional turn. That's absolutely true. So it's almost a hard counter in this kind of matchup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's Remand has always been very good in these matchups, even though Scape Shift costs four and they often have eight lands when they're casting it. Oh, well, look at that. So... Yep, he's actually just going for the combo here. Playing a land... And it's, and it's a scape shift. He's floating some mana. Okay, so just an uh, uh, update in the back, back tables. Um, Adam Pannoni actually uh, won that game. He was the Titan Shift player, beating the Living End deck. So we have all four matches having finished one game. Okay. This is kind of... Patrick's time to shine. So he, he has a through the breach, but nothing to to actually get put into play here. Yeah. So a, a few frustrating draws here. I mean, that's For that's got to be some of the danger of this. Like, you know, the Emrakul doesn't do anything without it. And pretty yeah, much Thruge doesn't do anything yeah. without it either. And that's the thing. That's the drawback to this type of strategy, right? Like if he was playing a, uh, a more traditional version those cards would have been threats that he could have played. Okay. Larry plays the Primal Titan that he saw two turns ago. Disdainful Stroke. Yep. Really, really efficient counter spell, especially for something cost six. So many of Larry's threats. Four or more. So this, this game's kind of hitting into a little bit of the mid to late game now. 
Oh. Yeah. And Cryptic Command. It's a fine card. Yep. So uh, Patrick's been able to deal with two of the uh, Titans. So I wonder if he's actually going to be able to like deal with all of them. Um, Patrick opting. Doesn't want that one. This does not look like a 1515 flyer. <laughs> <laughs> I shall put it on the bottom of my library. I think he picked up a Snapcaster Mage there. So he's got two That's through the nice breaches, one. a path, Snapcaster Mage. Um, so he's kind of clogged up with some, some kind of clunky cards right now. Like path doesn't really help him against many cards except for Titan, but he's actually countered both of them. Larry just chipping in for one with the Sakura Tribe Builder. And now with all the, the lands that Larry has in play, even just making his land drops, it's going to be a pretty fast clock here on Patrick. Yep, does a lightning bolt to the face with that mountain. And important to remember that... Um, I believe it's Tribe actually six damage to the face. Oh, there's mountain. two? Oh, yeah, there is yeah. two. I did. There's another one, so... Patrick's really in trouble here because the Sakura Tribe Elder itself actually represents six if it sacks. So just with a, another single attack, it's going to be lethal. That ne This next mm -hmm. attack is going to be lethal. So he's going to actually have to find some way to either block or kill the Sakura Tribe Elder. He, we know he has a path in hand. So the problem with the path is... Oh, I guess it doesn't really matter too much, but um, it'll still be six damage. So let's see. Is he going to... Uh, he's going to opt here, get a card deeper. Doesn't want that one. What is he looking for? Like, how, how do you think he, he deals with the situation here? Um, I think he needs the combo. The problem... The, the combo is good here because it will turn off the Vala cuts because there won't be enough permanence on the other side of the table. Okay. Finally got the... You do it? Through the breach. What did he put? He Ember did cool. it. Okay, so l let's see if this is enough. So what he's going to do is actually sacrifice the Sakura Tribe Elder. Yeah. Able to do six. Now... Patrick's only coming through for a 17. Larry's at 20. Mm -hmm. um, he only has to sacrifice... Like, it's uh, Annihilator 6, is that right? So, technically... So six cards? Yeah, it is. So. Yeah, it's 6, and so... So, any mountain. Any mountain will actually win the Lightning game. Lightning Bolt, also good enough. So, this will be interesting here. This is a lot of, a lot of draws really just straight up kill Patrick here. Um, he may have an extra turn, so just because the Snapcaster Mage only does two, though I'm not sure if maybe there's an extra Lightning Bolt or Helix. I think there's a Cryptic Command, which means that Patrick could bounce the Valakut back to his hand okay, and uh, really thin out the number of outs that are available to Larry here. And by bouncing that Valakut, he ensures that... Uh, you know, a, naturally drawing a mount is not good enough that Larry actually needs to draw a ramp spell so he can play the Valka and the ramp spell. Yeah. Center. Oh, he's not doing that. No, he doesn't have it. Oh, yeah. He doesn't have it. Okay. But he actually... Okay, so he actually draws another no. mountain. It ha happens to be a sheltered thicket, but it was good It was good enough. Wow. Wow. So, so the, uh, the last undefeated player, um, Patrick Tierney, and he was the, the, the first seed. It actually goes down to Larry Lee and his Titan shift deck. And that's impressive. That did not look like a good matchup on paper at all. You know, especially post-board where there were cards like Disdainful Stroke at the ready for Patrick. Um, but he was actually even able to, like, you know, withstand it and talk, like a 3 the bridge with the... Um, he with just the had Ibercle. enough permanence just in play. Do it. Okay, going to Seth Manfield and Julian John. Seth Manfield currently the one seed... Sorry, the, the f number one seeded player in the world. Ranked player in the world, sorry. And this is actually a, uh, a grudge match from round 14 where actually both players drew. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was actually a really, really, like, hard-fought match and it went to turns and Julian had a really dominating ball position but actually couldn't finish in time. 
this matchup should be interesting. I think, I mean, obviously they're playing uh, what is essentially a mirror, though Seth has access to Thoughtseize, and uh, the fact that Seth can take, you know, one of the big spells, a key card, out of Julian's hand, that should give him a slight edge here. On the downside, uh, Seth is playing White Border uh, as a, a Lansen. That's no. not good. That's not good in my part. <laughs> you don't like Chronicles? Ugh. You're not a fan of Chronicles? <laughs> you know, I don't... It's Chronicles is weird because I think Lifetime, I've seen so few packs of Chronicles. Like, I've seen less packs of Chronicles than I have revised, and yet there's so much Chronicles. <laughs> like, I feel like in my house I have more Chronicles cards than of any other set ever in Magic's <laughs> history. It's insane. It's like they just appear out of thin air. Chronicles was one of the first repeat sets for those who weren't around in the Stone Age of Magic. They actually did it like it was kind of the first Master set in some weird way. <laughs> yeah, you're right, it was. So uh, Seth was able to use that star to create green mana, and then uh, that lets him Sylvan Scrying for his last piece of Tron. And now, you know, he's off to the races. He's got access to seven mana on the third turn. It looks like Julian may have to wait until the fourth turn before he can, you know, have access to tapping all of his Tron lands in the same turn. He might have to tap these two for one mana piece and go and find that mine. Yeah. Um, he does have the card in hand, which is pretty much the best card in the matchup. I mean, it's it just trumps most of um, the opponent's cards, and it can go after the land uh, base of the opposing Tron player. And so just breaking that up, you know, generally making sure that they can't actually get to the big minor spells. So this will just, like depend on whether Seth actually has something to do with his uh, with his big mana because he's gonna hit it first. Yeah so looking for that big payoff here. Something that's interesting about Karn is that uh, you often want to be the second person to play your card. Yeah, but a lot of times it kind of depends if you can actually withstand the one um, one hit with the minus because sometimes it'll break up the point. Tron. Um, yeah. So you can't actually play the um, Karn in the next turn. But you're right. If uh, if there's a Karn and you actually have still have seven mana, play the second one kills the mm -hmm. first one. But uh, in this spot here, Seth could aggressively play a Karn, minus it, kill a tower, and... Yeah. He's looking like he's home free. Uh, feels like he doesn't have it because I, I think he would slam it pretty quickly. It's I agree. <laughs> I think he would be quite excited about it. He, so he tapped the tower to play a chromatic sphere, um, cycled, most likely going for a green, though possibly a black because he does have thought seizures in his deck. Yeah, I think his thought seizures are only post board actually now, looking at his deck list. So. He's uh, perhaps a bit nervous now. Has to worry about a Karn happening on the other side of the table. Okay, so he's playing another sphere and cycling it. So he actually still has one colorless floating right now. Did I miss this? No. I think he's one short. If uh, float, float, four. Nope. That's no. seven. He, because he casts a sphere. Actually, I think he's one short. No, no, he's good. Uh, it's oh, seven no, you're, mana. Yeah, yeah, you're seven right. You're right. Yeah, exactly no. five. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I, 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 actually, I actually forgot the extra mana that came from the sphere. Because the, yeah. He used that to cast the next sphere. I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally wrong. Um, I, I keep on thinking that the sphere doesn't generate another mana. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is really troublesome for uh, Seth. I mean, you know, he knows that uh, Julian has... A, a Karn in hand. One of the things that is quite good for him is he can't really go after the Thrag Tusk because um, Thrag Tusk doesn't actually care if it's exiled or, or destroyed it. Like when yeah, it and this, what's really great is that Karn goes down to three loyalty when it uses its minus ability. So if Julian does search for that Tron piece, then slam his Karn and minus it, breaking up Seth's Tron, then Seth can simply attack with a Thrag Tusk and uh, kill the Karn. If Julian wanted to exile the Thrag Tusk to, uh, you know, protect his Karn, then Seth could just attack with the token and deal with the Karn. 
So this Thrag Test play, even though Thrag Test doesn't seem like it's the most impressive thing you can do when you have access to seven mana, it matches up really nicely against what he knows that Julian is capable of doing right now. Yep, so it, it may be if Julian doesn't have anything better, he, he, his Karn will probably just try and break up the Tron because in both cases, if he tries to go for the Thrag Test, he's still going to lose his, his Karn. I mean, he could, in theory, on this turn, uh, simply cast Ugin the Spirit Dragon, and plus it killing the Thrag Tusk also. Right. He, d he also does have a... Um, he, he has Oblivion Stone in his hand, and he can cast it and activate it should he want to. But what that allows Seth to have is a full turn with all his uh, Tron Mana. It could be... Yeah, Seth could have easily found a Karn by now. All right, so Julian's going to go ahead and cast Ugin. So, okay. So he's actually using the Lightning Bolt ability from Ugin. Ugin going from 7 to 9 loyalty. Or was it maybe it's plus 3? Maybe it's 6 to, six to 9. Yeah. And the play, very important in a matchup like this. There's Karn, also very important. Okay, so Seth left with a beast that can somewhat pressure the, the Ugin down to six, but that's not really good enough because Ugin's going to be able to respond by killing that beast next turn, so Seth's going to have, a, have to have a, a better follow-up here. Yeah, now what Seth really wants here is Ulamog the Ceaseless <laughs> Hunger. <laughs> well... <laughs> That this. is a good card. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, um, what Seth can do with this is he can exile two of Julian's lands. This will keep Julian from, uh, you know, having access to Tron. And, uh, you know, this Ugin here, it does not match up very well against Ulamog the Sluice's Hunger. That's to be sure. But, uh, you know, Seth, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, the scenarios in which you'd rather have a Stone Rain than a, you know, exile your opponent's eight mana planeswalker but in this situation it may actually be correct for seth to exile two lands yeah and i'm, I'm sure seth will get to the bottom of it there are a lot of uh, factors at hand but yeah he's yep. going to go ahead and do that yep. and i like this play from seth a lot basically what he's trying to do is to make sure that there's no way of julian either having or top decking his way out of this situation because ugin himself uh, himself cannot kill Ulmog and if let's say Seth only went for one Tron land there's a chance that Julian would actually have that Tron land in his hand play it and then play Karn removing the Ulamog so you know I think I think that's that's the what the reason why he actually went to go for the land now you know what does Ugin really do kill the beast do three damage it's not mm -hmm. really uh, very good at, at the moment and Seth uh Put himself in a really good position here. There's an Oblivion Stone, but that does not really do much here. Not only that, uh, Seth chose wisely in which uh, Tron lands he, he, he destroyed because um, the, the one that was in Julian's hand was the same one. It was another mine. So what that means is he won't be actually be able to pop that Oblivion Stone until yeah, two turns from now. Yeah, Seth, somehow knowing which cards would be redundant in Julian's hand. He just felt it. <laughs> so an attack here. Going to finally get rid of this Ugin. Exile. A whole bunch of cards from Julian's library. Okay. And uh, you know, Seth's deck has tons of action at this point. Do you think there's a a risk, and I'm not saying this is a really big risk. So he he went. Oh, well, this is probably going to put the nail in the coffin. So whatever I was going to say is not going to be that important. Um, what uh, what I was going to say is, if he att if he attacked Karn, he he actually gives Julian a chance to actually get up to five mana and and and. Uh, use the uh, Oblivion Stone, but 
you know yeah he had the sanctum though so you have to know that like if, if he has the sanctum and he has any other big card in his hand then he knows that he's going to get a stone rain in the following turn from the uh what is it called uh world breaker that he'll be able to search up so, so now he yeah. can just he can remove exile another land with card liberty on the following turn and exile another land with world breaker on the following turn all while he's attacking with Ulamog. Okay, I'm going to actually call this because Yeah, uh, I think this one's <laughs> this one's over and done with. Let's go check out what's going on in that living in matchup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we came back just in time to see a living end. Let's see. I mean, he's 100% going to hit the living end. I don't know how good his, the creatures in his graveyard are. There it is. Shuffling. So something that's building. interesting about Living End against Kerr Tribal there, uh, that's one of the very best cards against Living End because you can sacrifice it. And then when they cascade and try to combo, it comes back to play and then you can sacrifice it again. And that oftentimes will put your mana in a range where Scape Shift is lethal. And the Living End deck doesn't play any interaction for the Scape Shift. So drawing a Secure Tribal, they're very powerful against the Living End deck. Uh, often puts you in a position where you're a full turn faster than you would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it looks like I see a Street Wraith and an Archfiend of Ifnir at least coming back for Raymond. So that that's a pretty respectable amount of creatures and probably one more. Yeah, and uh, one thing that's uh, important to note about uh, the Living End deck as of late is, you know, these new cycling creatures make the deck quite a bit more powerful. Uh, Archfiend of Ifnir is a big one. You know, a gigantic flyer is something the deck has wanted for a long time. Uh, that can just cycle for two. It's great. And the fact that when it comes back, you can just start cycling more cards and uh, punish people who have creatures of their own in the graveyard. And it's flying. I think that's a really, really... I think the, that's uh, the biggest yeah. factor of all, yeah. Just able to get over a lot of the cards that come back from it. Okay. So Adam blocking the monstrous Carabid with his Sakura Tribe Elder. Getting a mountain, bringing him to six land. Um, if he has a land and escape shift, I don't know exactly in his hand. He will he'll be, likely have a lethal. Yes. If not, it's going to be, you know, another... Let's see, how much damage got get through that turn? Like eight? So yep. Adam's on 11. So he actually has lethal right now. So... so you know, unless he does something to Raymond's creatures or kills Raymond completely, he's going to be facing lethal damage the next turn. So the new cycler that I've been most impressed with at a Living End deck when I've played against it is Horror of the Broken Lands. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have people cast Living End and then they'd attack me on the following turn and I wouldn't be dead and then I'd have to get attacked again for them to kill me. So I'd have some time to like figure something out. Whereas nowadays, they... Living End, this Heart of the Broken Lands comes back, and they cycle like three cards in the next turn when they attack me, and I just lose. <laughs> okay, so um, Raymond actually plays a Fulminator Mage, getting rid of the Stomping Ground on Adam's side. Actually, that's quite important because it means that the Scape Shift Land combo does not get him the full amount of damage. Yeah, so Adam would need to be able to do something like uh, play a Ramp Spell, and play a scape shift this turn and have a land to play and if he can do all of that then he could deal 18 damage on this turn uh, however it looks like he may have to be content with if, if he has one land at least uh, you know casting a primeval titan or doing something in that regard um, one of the lands in his hand is a valakut but that one comes into play tapped so that's not actually not good. very good for him right now and it may actually... Okay, there's the Valakut, so no t uh, prime time right now. So does actually casting Scape Shift do anything here? Like, let's say he needs a Desperation Scape Shift. Um, it doesn't do anything here. It's only six lands. Yep. One more land and it would do a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> So Adam really kind of th he's got I think he has two prime times summoner's pack and then some red card yeah and I think he actually has a scape shift too so 
it looks like he may not actually be able to stop the, the, the lethal attack. Okay, he goes summoners. Packed. It's possible that he has something else to cast. Maybe something like a Thrag Tusk or... Or Secure Tri Builder, I oh. imagine. Okay. Yeah. So, this will actually mean that he doesn't die next turn unless actually if... A Cycler rip, kills him. A <laughs> There are a lot of cyclers in this deck. <laughs> a cycler will kill him, but also he has to pay for the pack the next turn. So he doesn't really give himself that much extra time. Well, what's interesting, though, is that he'll have to pay for the pact, but if he's able to get an untapped land, uh, he'll still have enough mana right. to scape shift. He'll get up to eight. Yeah. Because the Sakura Tribe Elder actually brings him up to seven, and he has to kind of draw an un untapped one, giving him eight, allowing him to pay for the pack as well as still play the type, the, the escape shift the next turn. And I, I'm actually uh, pretty impressed with Adam here. I mean, I think a lot of people would have just conceded on that last turn. He uh, he found a way for it to be possible for him to win, and. Uh, He's going to give himself an opportunity, every opportunity available, to find a way to win this game against Living End. Okay, let's see if Raymond has a one mana cycler that allows him to actually. Actually, actually doesn't need a one mana cycler, he can do it on his uh, main phase as well. He just has to have a cycler. Mm -hmm. Pretty good percentage of his deck. Yes. Okay. So, is it? Could it be? Seems pretty unlikely. Not. Oh wow! No cycler. Wow. So now, the door is a tiny crack open for Adam to. Yeah. Has to, like to draw an untapped land unless Raymond has another card to to change the situation. I mean, he could have a Fulminator Mage, which actually puts them back again. That would actually be pretty optimal. Um, it, I'm trying to think of other cards that he could have had. Yeah, I mean, it could just be something like um, copies of Living End, you know, uh, Cascade spells, lands. The thing is, that I think the cascade, both cascade spells kill um, Adam because he could actually play the dread on the elder, so it couldn't block, so he would die. Or the plus one from the uh, violent outburst would also kill him. So um, actually, it might not kill him. That, that wouldn't be enough. So the violent outburst, it's possible he had that in his hand. So that would only be ten damage rather than eleven. Is it a may? The, the the when you cascade. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to cast it. You okay. don't have to cast it. Yeah, it's been a little while on that. And mechanic. that would have been that actually would have been worth to do because he has a windswept yeah. piece and actually would have locked him out of like you know using that as a way of getting through the next turn. So actually, probably would have just won the game on there. Yes. So. It'll be interesting to see what actually was in Raymond's hand there. I actually do see a Violent Outburst. He may not have... Oh, hold on. He, does he have a green? No, he has a Blooming Marsh. Yeah, he has a Blooming Marsh and a uh, Black Leaf Cliffs. A pair of swamps there. So. I, think, I think he may have just kept it because he, he wanted to have it back up. And yeah. Also, he may also have some way to interact if Adam does go off right here. Like, he may have some sort of instant speed way to interact, right? I mean, he, he like kind of Beast does, Within or something? Like that's, that's a card he could definitely have as Beast Within. Right. I'm trying to figure out... Does He, he can actually return the Fulminator as an instant. I don't know. Does that save him? Um, yes, sure. it does. Oh. If, he, if Adam's going off with seven. Okay. But Adam couldn't draw the extra land to actually try and go off, and so... Raymond actually is able to take it to a third game. And Living End is a deck that has, uh, you know, come and gone over the history of modern. It's a deck that is like Dredge, uh, 
you know, somewhat weak to graveyard for removal for obvious reasons. But the thing about it is, it's not like it just dumps a whole bunch of stuff into the graveyard and then, you know, does this thing. It's cycling those cards. So, you know, if you can't find your, you know, cycle, your cascade spell that's going to allow you to combo, so many of the cards in your deck have this cycling mechanic that they actually, like, part of the combo helps you find the other part of the combo, which is a pretty impressive thing. You know, you're, you're, by putting the creatures in your graveyard to be reanimated, you're drawing for the reanimation spell. And, uh, you know, the living death effect, the effect of, you know, wrathing the board and then putting all the creatures from the graveyard back into the battlefield is so powerful because if your opponent's being aggressive, you know, you get to wipe the board while creating a massive board presence. And it makes, you know, creature-based matchups just dream matchups for you. And uh, against decks that have a lot of targeted discard, you're a really strong deck also because when you're playing this type of combo deck, you wait till their end step, you cycle a bunch of things, and then during that process of cycling things, you can find the Cascade spell that they would have normally beaten combo decks by making the combo deck discard key cards. But you find those cards on their end step. So you can beat those decks with discard spells. Uh, traditionally, Living End is uh, pretty weak to blue decks, to decks that can simply counter the Living End. Uh, Remand is especially powerful against Living End. Uh, it feels really, 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 really bad when your opponent has a Remand and you're playing Living End. I wonder how, how many times you actually win by just suspending Living End, and, you know, kind of playing to that. I've never seen it happen. <laughs> I haven't played with the deck, but I've, I've seen a number of people play the deck. I have friends that play the deck. They, I'm sure one of them has a story of it happening. But I've never seen it happen personally. Okay, we're finishing sideboarding and shuffling up for game three. Important to note that uh, the players actually were had access to each other's uh, deck lists, so you, you have a little bit more information to how to sideboard in the in the in the quarterfinals and the rest of the finals. Yeah, so they. Uh have full knowledge of what the other person has access to here. There is a Relic of Progenitus in the sideboard for Adam. I'm sure he'd really like to draw that one. Anything else that's... Uh, Anything graveyard-centric? No. However, he does have uh, other cards which are pretty decent in general. I, You know... He has two Inferno Titan in the, in the sideboard. Do you think it's good enough to bring in so he have more threats? You know, I think he may just end up keeping his deck as is with one Relic of Progenitus, perhaps over uh, one Lightning Bolt. He may want to take out the other two bolts and bring in uh, more threats, but that's about all I can think of. Maybe Tireless Tracker could be good here. So how does uh, Raymond actually change his deck? He's, he's got some pretty dedicated like sideboard cards, but I don't know if any of them are particularly good in this matchup. So Slaughter Games can be quite good in this matchup. Uh, you know, if you take the Scape Shifts out of their deck or you take the Primeval Titans out of their deck, uh, you know, it basically makes their deck do half as much. Uh, another card, Beast Within, uh, you know, functions as a Stone Rain. We saw it in the last game. Uh, be very strong. Or we, we didn't see it. We saw Fulminator Mage, but it would have functioned very similarly to Fulminator Mage. Uh, the, the card, you know, it kills a land, and if you're using it, especially before a living end, the drawback of giving your opponent a 3 3 is completely mitigated. So that's a card that Raymond's really happy to pick up from post boarded games. So I think Raymond's matchup certainly gets better post board. I still think this is a, a fairly even matchup. I think Adam uh, really wants to draw secure dry builders, and he really wants to draw scape shifts. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, <clears throat> it is really interesting. I mean, a lot of these decks appear non-interactive, kind mm -hmm. of like the, their plans are very linear. But ultimately, it's it's kind of a, a game of information. It's like how fast do I need to go to actually, you know, to push? Because you know, let's say something like storm, or let's say something like. Uh, um, Tron, to, like knowing what your opponent can do and is capable of doing is really, really important. So, how you position yourself, because sometimes you just want to give yourself a little bit more time if you have time for it. Yeah, and, and for example, in that last game, I think uh, I think Raymond, 
you know, he could have used that violent outburst yep. uh, last turn, and that would have cut off the ability to sacrifice that windswept teeth, which could have made all the difference in the game. And it's, it's these little small edges that uh, you look for over the course of a match. Okay. Getting started on the last game of the quarterfinals. I did see a demonic dread in Raymond's hand, so he definitely has a way of like putting a living end onto the stack. One th weird thing about the uh, demonic dread, it actually needs a target to be a cast. So if Adam doesn't play a creature, I mean, he doesn't have that many creatures, um, he won't actually be able to play the demonic dread. I mean, obviously, Remy could put his target his own creature, but he doesn't actually have that many um, smaller creatures, so it actually it's possible that he can't do it, play it on the turn three. Yeah, so here we see a turn one Relic of Regenerus for Adam, and he's got to be really thrilled with that. Uh, again, post-board, he has three copies of this in his deck now. Okay, we have a, just an update for uh, the Nathan Smith-Michael Byers match. Uh, Nathan Smith on Dredge versus Michael Byers on Monogreen Tron. Uh, Nathan Smith with Dredge actually 1-2-1 one, one over uh, Michael Byers. So one of the Tron decks going down there. Wow. Well done by Nathan Smith. I mean... Michael Byers' deck had main deck roller card Genetis, and it had uh, quite a few Ugin, the Spirit Dragon. Both cards are uh, very strong against Dredge, so Nathan Smith doing some good work out there defeating these uh, Tron Overlords. So just to uh, recap this, uh, Larry Liu is through to the semifinals with Scape Shift, Seth Manfield with Black Green Tron, um, and Nathan Smith with Dredge. So three different decks. Um, Maybe four, maybe only at three, because uh, if uh, Raymond wins, it will be four, and if Titan Shift wins, it will actually be three, because I think the yeah, Scape Shift... Shift will be the deck of the weekend, Yeah, <laughs> after all that. <laughs> <laughs> Titan Shift and Scape Shift are very, very similar. I, I, like, I, I generally pull them in, into the same like, pool of decks. <coughs> yeah, so I kind of have always thought that Scape Shift as a deck, that you're referring to a deck with Cryptic Command in it. When you say Titan Shift, I think you're talking about a red-green deck. Uh, but when you say Titan Shift or red-green Scape Shift, I think of the same deck. <laughs> right. I think that they're... Actually, and, and, and to be honest, uh, you know, having a closer look at these decks, they're pretty close. Larry tries to be a little bit more, I'll call it combo-y, because he, he has um, Colony Heart Expedition. And uh, Omen, then. Omen combos well with Expedition, right. I imagine. So. Yeah, so with, whereas there's no Prismatic Omens in... Uh, Adam's deck, so he's much more on the Titan plan rather than the, you know, mega combo plan with uh, Prismatic Omen and Scape Shift. Okay, so Adam gets a pretty optimal, like, start. I mean, like, Relic Progenitus, obviously one of the best cards um, against the Living End deck. But he also has actually been able to es essentially effectively ramp twice. I mean, he's already ramped once with one of his Sakura Tribe Elders. He has another one in play, so he can get up to like five mana and six mana on, on his fourth turn. And what's really impressive about this draw from Adam right now is that when he sacrifices the second Sakura Tribe Elder, then when Raymond casts a Living End, it's going to essentially mean that Adam has access to two additional lands on the following turn because both those Sakura Tribe Elders will re-enter the battlefield. And if that's happening, then any scape shift that Adam draws at some point or another will basically just be lethal right away. Right, and Living End does not win the turn... Like, it casts Living End. It actually wins the turn after because the, the mm -hmm. creatures themselves um, don't have haste. So, you know, there's often a lot of creatures in, in play, but not uh, a lethal amount. And if the Titan Shift player is actually able to, you know, ramp up to the next uh, minor level, they can just win on the turn before they get attacked. Yes, yeah, so now Adam uh, is going to get a little bit aggressive with the Scourge Travel there. Does not have a fourth land or a ramp spell. Wow. Cannot I mean, be happy about that. So one interesting thing about uh, Raymond's play the last turn, he actually uh, fulminated the Stomping Ground and not the Valakut. Now, obviously trying to knock Adam off his second green. Um, what do you think of that? Um... I think it's very interesting. I, I think I like it because it, uh, it prevents Adam from doing things like p 
paying for uh, Summoner's Pact and casting Scape Shift on the same turn. Um, oh, he has another Fulminator Mage, too. That cool. makes it even more impressive. So I think Raymond is now turned into a, a Ponza deck. Yeah, <laughs> looks like it. I mean, he might be... He could hard cast a Monstrous Carabin next turn, and I would feel very good about his chances of winning this game. Yeah, no, actually, I, it, it's definitely... Um, one of the angles of the Living End deck, a lot of times if you, they play against Graveyard Hate, they just start hard casting their five mana creatures. Yeah. Like, imagine he just goes Archfiend of Vifnir here. Yep. That's, that's a real problem, right? That's a five power flying creature. 14 clock. You know, he's got Monstrous Carabid. Also, you know, a reasonable clock. And Adam's not really got any sort of pressure, like... He's uh, uh, stalled on mana, so there's no threat of either a Titan or a Scape Shift with any relevance. Ooh, does Raymond have another Fulminator Mage? That would be really good. <laughs> Though mean, Adam does not have a... Uh, he doesn't have a non-basic, basic. but, I mean, it's still insane, right? You just President. kill whatever non-basic when they draw it. Okay, Raymond... Tapping out almost certainly for a, a fatty. And it's probably the best one because it's the one that can't be blocked by most of, actually all of Adam's deck. I don't think he has any flyers or reach creatures. Yeah, so this is Archfiend of Vifnir. Uh, if any of you guys played with this card in Limited, it was awesome. <laughs> Have you played Sealed Deck with that card? Oh, yeah. It's the best thing that's ever happened, person. I actually opened this one at the pre-release and I was like, oh... I think I got one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th I think this worked out well for me. Okay. It really looked like Living End was in trouble with that start of like Relic and double uh, Secure Tribe Elder, but Adam just unable to capitalize on that. Yeah, I mean, double Fulminator Mage put him in a pretty rough spot. Yep. And now here he is, forced to uh, crack this Relic of Regenitus. Yeah, he, and, he, just, uh, he, he, he just realizes that... Uh, the game's not going to be about the graveyard now. It's just good. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have an answer to the Archfiend, at least at hand. And, you know, four turns later, he, he's going to be uh, take lethal damage. Adam, by the way, uh, ordering that very well. Uh, he made sure to crack the Relic Progenitus before sacrificing the Secure Tribal, just in case Living End did become a factor later on in the game. Wants to ensure that uh, that Living End will allow him to get that secure travel they're back representing another land I mean Adam's still actually not very far off um, you know starting to recontrol the game I mean it, it, two land and then he casts like uh, a primeval titan and then the next turn scape shift kills him again so it's it's not that far off and he drew a land which is good for him okay Let's see if Raymond actually adds to the board, because actually adding to the board is not irrelevant here. It speeds up the clock by quite a bit. And right now, Adam uh, is going to be attacked down to 13 by this Archfiend of Ifnir. Optimally, would like to cast another Archfiend. Let's see. If yeah, close the door. <laughs> yep, okay. It's a Street Wraith. Probably the least like worrisome of all the creatures because this doesn't <laughs> it's so funny that people it's just like it's just a 3-4 for 5 <laughs> that's all it is right now in this matchup and yet it is uh, basically just as good as like a you know a 6-6 six, six or a 7-7 seven, seven for 5 would be in this spot okay so actually this is really interesting because <laughs> now Adam doesn't look like he's in danger of dying next turn he definitely has a sixth land available available to him with the Secure Tribe Elder, um, and so and we know that he has Scape Shift in hand. So, actually, he's a land away from just winning the game. Yeah, <clears throat> he's a land away from uh, you know making his way to the semifinals here. Okay, so Raymond uh, pays uh, life to, pays life to cycle the Street Wraith. And did he not sacrifice it to he the did. ability? Oh, okay. He did. I thought it cycled, and then he <laughs> just put it in the graveyard and didn't pick up his deck, and I was so confused. <laughs> um, Marginally terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to think of like ways that uh, the math can change here. Um, 
it's possible if Raymond, I, I didn't check his mana, but if he has two uh, violent outbursts, he'll put Adam to 12, mm -hmm. meaning that the, uh, the foothills foot is turned off. But that's probably not that important because he, d he doesn't actually need it. Um, he doesn't For need escape shift one. Yeah, that's right. So Adam really is going to go sweat a land. Yep, he doesn't look like he has one available to him. So, oh, you know what? I think he actually may be able to win anyway because I think he has a um, a summoner's pact. Oh, so he could go get a secure tribe elder, right? Yeah, and in doing so, by finding that secure tribe elder, he uh, puts himself up to seven lands, okay. and they can go off. Wow! Adam, Adam, uh, Raymond attacks for eight, bringing Adam down to five. Yeah, and. Uh, Okay, so let's see. Let's see what's happening here. I'm not positive he has a uh, summoner's pack, but he really just needs a land. He does not draw a land, but actually he draws search for tomorrow, which is good enough because Brick puts a land to play untapped. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he so. Did. Yeah, search for tomorrow here would put him up to four remaining untapped lands. So you can play, tap those four lands, cast Scape Shift, and uh, deal Raymond 18 damage. Is there anything Raymond that could 18 happen? life. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that could happen? I mean, so there's Beast Within. So it's, it's actually possible that, uh, you know, Raymond could Beast Within response. Is, is it possible to um, respond to the Valka triggers or is it already too late? You can, in fact, respond to the Valka triggers. So Valka, um, you can't respond to the Valka triggers in the way of like, oh, I'll kill the Valka before these triggers go on the stack and kill me. But you can do it in such a way that when those triggers are all on the stack, you use a, uh, a land destruction spell um, that will kill one of the mountains. Right. And then if the, when it checks to see the other mountains, if there aren't five other mountains, it will not deal the three damage. Right. So if he doesn't have enough basic mountains, it, it actually may be tr troublesome there. Okay. Yeah. If Raymond has beast within which uh i think he has three copies of post board in this matchup okay adam is going to sacrifice his elder getting another mountain sacrifice the foot foothills going down to s to seven i'm not sure if he's actually i think he's at four actually but in any case he's yeah. going to cast scape shift Let's see if Raymond has any sort of, like, comeback here. Well, Raymond doesn't seem like he's conceding immediately, so... Yeah, I mean, if he had Beast within, he could just use it on the Cinder Glade here in response to the Escape Shift, and then... Oh, yes. The Escape Shift wouldn't even do oh, anything. Oh, wow. Okay. So he, he doesn't have it from the looks of things. And uh, Adam... If he finds six... Different mountains and a Valakut. Believe the game ends. I think Raymond's just kind of setting it up as a, a check, doing a, 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 a read of the scape shift to see, like, is there any way that this does not kill me? Has a look at the Valakut, but I think if he had something, he would have probably responded by now. He can't kill a mountain now because he's getting six mountains. Oh, but it has Go to be five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he can kill a mountain. He can kill a mountain. It's good enough. So all these triggers are on. He hasn't conceded yet. He has not. So it makes me think, does, does he have something? I think he's not even sitting at the table anymore. I think he's asking He, he may judge. be asking a judge <laughs> how it works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... I don't think the judge can explain this to him, by the way. I think he's allowed to read... I think... I mean, he has to read the card himself and figure it out, right? Um, I think he can ask certain questions. Like, he says, if there are not five mountains, five other mountains in play, does it, like, resolve um, in, in the yeah. positive? I think he can ask that question. If he asks it like that. I, I don't think a judge could give you... An answer to that question. Really? I okay. think a judge would say, read the card. <laughs> yeah. So. It, I mean, it's, it's an interesting situation. Yep. We can actually 
see Raymond actually just with one of the judges asking. But I mean, if if he had had the beast within at all, he could have just used it in response to the yeah, escape so shift. Is there anything else? I mean, let's have a quick look at the, the living in deck. Is there anything else he could respond to? Because if he has cycling cards, he could actually cycle and maybe try to get... Um, maybe try to within. find it right now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Beast Within is the only card in here that uh, yeah. could interact at all right now. Yep, I'm pretty sure... I mean, the thing is, so. if, 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 if he does have the Beast Within, he might as well just cast it. Yeah, because right. if it works, it works. Yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> it, doesn't right? it doesn't, it doesn't. So... <laughs> I, I agree with you. <laughs> Just to see what happens, right? I mean, but this right, judge... So he's coming back to the table. Okay. All right. The longest sweat of all. <laughs> Here we go. This is going to be so brutal for Adam. <laughs> if he has it, this is the worst slow roll of all time. Uh, but he doesn't look like he ha has it. It does not. Oh, oh, my <laughs> goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my, oh, oh my God. Oh. Uh, oh, no. Oh, my God. Uh. Okay. So, uh, it looks like Raymond DeVoe. Uh, so, what happens here is, uh, you know, Valica, there have to be five. The triggers go on the stack, but when the trigger resolves, it checks to make sure there are five of their mountains. There were not. So, the Valica triggers do nothing. And Raymond DeVoe will be able to attack for the win on the following turn. Yeah, and I mean, look. I, okay, I mean, that was a that was that was an amazing. I mean, I, I'm I'm sure Raymond didn't do that on purpose. He just wasn't sure about the rules because, I mean, he he went off. He he talked to the judge. He, I think he was very very careful about that. Uh, but that's the end of the quarterfinals. So uh, we'll be back after these messages.